Hi, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I think what's very different from the usual West experience is that you can ac actually see all these uh, little windows popping up and people joining from different time zones. So it's indeed very special. And welcome to our session, Reimagining manufacturer, Manufacturing Industries for Growth. And my name is Li Sixuan, and I'm an anchor with China Central Television's business channel, as well as a member of the West's Young Global Leader community. We all know that the world has experienced tectonic changes since we last met in Davos in person around the same time last year. And at that time, it would have been very hard to believe that my study would one day be live streamed on the West's website. And perhaps more so than never in our lifetimes, Manufacturing companies have seen shocks and changes in supply and demand and are now faced with this unique challenge to reinventing themselves to become engines of economic growth. And I want to give you some background of our session. So our session is part of the two initiatives under the forums, Shaping the Future of Advanced Manufacturing and Production, Focus, uh, this is the focus area in the platform. And the first initiative is the Global Lighthouse Network, uh, which aims to accelerate the more inclusive adoption of advanced technologies in manufacturing. And to date, uh, 54 manufacturing lighthouses have been identified uh, from different industry sectors. And the other initiative, which I would also like to make special mention of, is the New Business Models Initiative. And that is led by the WEF's Global Future Council. And um, today's session will be divided into two parts. Uh, the, thir the first 30 minutes will be an interactive discussion with our panel speakers. Uh, that will be live streamed on the forum website. And the second 30 minutes will continue as a group dialogue session, so where uh, all the participants can join in for a dialogue via top link. And we have a very incredible group of panelists representing industry-leading lighthouses uh, in their respective fields. So let me introduce them to you. Uh, they're Mr. Dimitri DeVries, uh, who is the co-CEO and COO of Royal DSM. Welcome. Can you, you can wave your hand or say hi to people. Hi. And uh, we have Mr. Bjorn Rosengren, who is the CEO of ABB. Welcome. Thank you. And we have, welcome. And we have uh, Ms. Kathy Wengel, who is the Executive VP and Chief Global Supply Chain Officer of Johnson & Johnson. Welcome. That's uh, early in the morning there. Uh, we definitely know that the pandemic has triggered a greater urgency around uh, cost reduction, uh, supply chain optimization, and also the adaption of 4IR technologies to more effectively redesign our manufacturing processes. And so to start our session, I would like to go around the room and get a, a very short and focused answer from each one of our panelists. Have you experienced major uh, supply demand shocks in your sector? And what is the one top priority uh, in terms of tech innovation that you are aiming to uh, adopt in order to boost productivity and growth in a sustainable way. So let me start with uh, Mr. Dimitri DeVries of Royal DSM. I, I actually know that you adapted very quickly early in the pandemic and started manufacturing no swaps for the first time in your company's history. But more generally, uh, what was the most significant technological challenge or innovation that you have encountered in the past year? Yeah, I think what we have seen is that, that there was an immediate disruption of supply chain. Um, and as we are producing food ingredients, which have been critical, as well as electronics in the biomedical device sphere, we were immediately asked how we could keep up the supply chain. So there we've applied our innovation pretty quickly. I think we have moved all our offers and supply chain personnel who, who need, don't need to be in a manufacturing or warehouse site to move from one weekend from working at their offices and warehouses into working from home. And we could do that by applying our digital network from day one to two. So in one weekend, we've moved 10,000 people 
um, in, in one go and keep the supply chain uninterrupted. And I would say that was a, a major step, which, uh, which we, we would not have seen before. And we were very proud that we could do that. But um, I, would, I can tell you every day it was surprised what we could do uh, and keep the supply chain up and running during the pandemic. And uh, just very quickly, I thank you very much. And very quickly uh, to Mr. Uh, Rosengren, that um, I noticed that ABB saw a very typical V-shaped pattern last year. So during the first two quarters of 2020, you were impacted by lockdowns. But in Q3, uh, your profit, if I'm right, rose by 86% as infrastructure demand surged. Well, uh, so my question is that it usually takes time to adjust production capacity, but what did you do to really improve all these efficiency and flexibility? And what is the next frontier in technology innovation that you think will drive a further industrial transformation and growth? Yeah, thank you, Lee. Uh, it's exciting to be here. Yeah, it's been a challenging year, not least for me, as I'm quite new in, in ABB. And of course, going into the pandemic, uh, there are, of course, a huge challenges for a company like ABB, which is global and in so many different parts of the world. We are also supporting so many different uh, segments uh, of the world. And of course, there's been different challenges in, in uh, different parts. But I, I think the first immediate uh, uh, reaction, of course, in a pandemic for a company like ABB, it was, of course, to make sure that we can try to keep our people safe. That has always been number one. And the second thing is, you know, how can we support our customers globally to make sure that they can have their operations up and running uh, as much as possible? So, so th that has been uh, the, the focus for us uh, uh, for us during this pandemic. Then I think if we're going more in to see a little bit what is actually happening in the industry and what has been uh, important for us, we can see that um, there are things that is influencing the transformation of industry. And there are certain trends which we see are important. One thing is that the you know, consumers are asking for more customized individual uh, products, I mean, which leads to shorter production series. So you have to adopt your production according to that. We see also higher unpredictability and therefore uncertainties and fluctuations in bands. And I think COVID is a very good example of that. And I think as number three, I think there is also... Um, we see also, of course, the technology which has been available during this whole period, including artificial intelligence and, and um, connectivity. And I think all of this has, has helped us to drive the trends to support our customers, to help them be more flexible, but also to work more simpler. So a little bit uh, from our perspective, I think uh, when we look at the, uh, the customer perspective is that more focus on automation and robotics has uh, been important. Robots is nothing new, but of course, technology in the robots has actually helped us, uh, you know, both because they are more intelligent today, easier to operate, and it helped us customers to become a little bit more flexible. So I think that's been important parts uh, uh, to uh, to work. Then, of course, in the pandemic, costs have been much lower as we've been traveling, and we're using technology to actually uh, support our customer in an efficient way. And we learned to adopt this, and that has actually helped us to produce better numbers. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you talk about this idea of being very people-centered and very customer-centered. And you mentioned something that the customer nowadays, they're very they need all these customized products or service, and uh, there's great unpredictability. I think all of those pose challenge in terms of supply chain. So I would also uh, like to go to uh, our next uh, uh, panelist, um, Ms. Wengel, uh, who is the chief uh, executive VP and chief global supply chain officer of Johnson & Johnson. So let's uh, focus more around supply chain. So how are 4 technologies driving growth in global uh, supply chain? Well, thank you, Sushen, and it's uh, terrific to be here with everyone. You know, this uh, future manufacturing initiative has been so important to us at Johnson & Johnson to be part of from the 
from the beginning. And as you mentioned, we could hardly imagine being, you know, being together a year ago and now what's happened in the world. And certainly supply chains have become more and more front and center through that. You know, in our industry, healthcare, uh, even more critical uh, throughout the throughout the pandemic, uh, our our sites around the world, more than 100 plants, 300 distribution centers, uh, you know, from the very beginning in Wuhan, uh, you know, all the way through where we are today. Uh, I share with my colleagues that first and foremost, the importance of of our team, whether it's suppliers, whether it's our employees, keeping them healthy and safe, uh, you know, as the pandemic grew, making sure we provided them with all the tools they needed to keep our essential, our frontline superheroes, as we call them, uh, as well as all of us working, as as mentioned, you know, from from home. But all of that was around ensuring that healthcare was delivered really around the around the globe. And so, when we look at how supply chains not only therefore kept businesses going, kept every one of our businesses going amidst the pandemic, but they really are uh, an engine for growth. And so, if we look at at technology and that intersection of what technology is doing with science today and how it it allows us to not only um, develop new medicines or medical devices in a different way, but to manufacture and to distribute them in different ways. Um, It's clearly an engine for growth. So I'd say there are kind of three main areas I'd focus on in that growth piece. First is channels for access. So as we saw through the pandemic, as hospital systems were overwhelmed, there had to be new channels and new points of access, telemedicine, uh, the ability to do more things in an outpatient setting. And that creates a whole different dynamic for providing products uh, rather than to big hospitals that might have warehouses, you know, to small clinics and much more on time. Uh, things like demand sensing and e-commerce, and I, uh, we, I think we all believe a, a fundamental permanent shift uh, in how even all of us as consumers may be buying our, our goods. Uh, so that, that supply chain as a mode for access uh, and whether it is that, you know, 11 day in China or it's our drone program in the Kalangana region of Uganda, um, that allows us to reach HIV patients directly with the delivery of their medicine. That's really key. And then the other thing I, I, I'd focus on is really uh, agility, resilience right? We're, throughout the pandemic, uh, supply chain traceability and visibility as ports were closing, as aircraft was being grounded. Um, you know, we would have a ship that would have our goods on it. We would see it and suddenly the port where it was heading was closed and we had to figure out how to reroute uh, those critical healthcare supplies. And so having that direct um, live visibility was huge. And then I, I'd really echo and close with uh, the method, message about personalization in all our industries, you know, how things like 3D printing allow us to do much more precision uh, products for people, whether it's in a consumer business with a custom face cream uh, or a medical device implant uh, or personalized medicines, um, it, the technology is just unlocking totally new ways to grow. So um, accessibility, agility, and uh, personalization. Yeah. I think all of those are the, uh, the, the key takeaways and the key changes, uh, technological changes that we are seeing in, this, uh, in the supply chain and also shaped by the pandemic. And we think that leading manufacturers are likely to be able to deploy all these uh, more advanced technologies at scale more easily. And um, so I just uh, checked uh, earlier today that all of your st- stocks have been buoyed by the market rally up between 52 uh, even over 100% since the lows of late March last year. So clearly this uh, speaks to investors' confidence looking into the future. But the recovery we are seeing in the industry has been uneven across different subsectors. So my question, uh, which is in keeping with the goal of the web platform for this panel, is to discover a new business models and also new forms of private and public partnership that can transform industries more inclusively. So I wonder what is your take on that? Dimitri? Yeah, you want me to start? Yeah, great. I, I appreciate that question because I think this is the key to the future. I think um, companies who think that uh, along the axis of people, planet, profit, 
you can only be successful on profit. I think those will be the dinosaurs of the future. And we all know that currently no dinosaurs exist. So I think the new way of shaping companies is around people, planet, profit in a holistic way. And we feel as TSM and, and me personally very strongly that the economic system which we have today um, is too much monodimensional towards profit. So we feel that you were, you were referring to public-private. I would basically say this is not only public-private. This is consumers, it's governments, it is manufacturing companies, it's suppliers in the holistic view on how you impact people, planet, profit. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen fantastic examples where consumers, governments, uh, but also producers work together. I mean, you were highlighting a little bit that we were developing no swaps for the tests. Um, we've never produced those. Um, we were asked by the government to see if we could ramp it up because they wanted to ramp up the test numbers. Within two weeks, we have these swaps innovated. We have them been tested. We have them been 3D printed locally where it was needed, all in close collaboration with universities um, governments and companies. So I think the new model is based on what we've learned in COVID-19 to use the economic system in a way that waste impact of people is incorporated in how we present uh, profit and loss, not only financially, but overall. So taking the full responsibility of the holistic system, but the system is being misused currently because waste and making profit at the cost of the planet is not being incorporated in the way how we measure the success, but also the responsibility of companies. And, and there we stand for, and I think the learning from COVID-19 pandemic, we need to apply in a new way of how business needs to operate, a new innovative business model along the three axes of triple P. Yes, we've been talking about this notion of stakeholder and then ESG, all these responsibilities. But one question, um, I think, for Dimitri and also for um, our following uh, speakers is that how do we really, as companies, especially public companies, we are responsible for our stakeholders and also our um, shareholders. So how do we really quantify and measure those efforts? I think that's also something uh, worth discussing. And I, uh, if you have uh, something else to add on this front? Yeah, well, I mean, we have, we have trials uh, a little bit how to measure this. So what we, what we, for instance, measure is not only our, what we call scope one and scope two emissions of CO2, but also how we impact uh, a better carbon footprint for our customers. And we call that uh, brighter living solutions. And if we come with a solution for our customers in the value chain, we measure that. And today, 65% of what we sell uh, falls under that category. So it also means that 35% still has room for improvement. And we have a target to move that year after year up into percentages. So you can start measuring that. I think it's not easy, but it's coming. Uh, and if you start sending the metric, you will have a good discussion. And today, uh, we as, as, as DSM, we also ask our auditor, our financial auditor to audit our brighter living solution, our sustainability metric. Mm. So it's the next step in that journey. Indeed. So we are keeping very clear track of it and then keeping all the metrics and KPIs. Thank you very much for your um, input. Uh, uh, Mr. Rosengren? Yeah, maybe I can add on to that also. I think... Of course. Yeah, baby, I think it's important for all our stakeholders. And, you know, of course, we have our financial measures that we need to, uh, to reach. But of course, they're becoming uh, other objectives. And we have so many stakeholders who look upon us in different way. And I think part of our business model is actually to helping our customers to become more sustainable. So that drives both businesses as we can also measure uh, what we can help them to improve uh, you know, their footprint. So it's not only taking care of our own operations, which is, but also to support uh, the customers. And we see more by investors, and it, it, it's also our financial investors who, who take this very high up on the agenda because they see that the companies that will be successful in this will also be more successful into the future. Hmm. So I guess the ecosystem has to thrive so that everyone will benefit from it. But then, uh, Mr. Rosengren, I'm just wondering, um, following 
um, what you just said, are there any new business models that you're currently planning to adopt or explore in terms of creating these new value for all of your stakeholders and whole, whole society? You know, I th think in, in the end, uh, you know, our success is the success of our customers. And the new technology gives us opportunities that we uh, didn't have uh, uh, before. And just an example, so we, we have something which we call the collaborative operation offerings. Uh, and I think uh, this is a way where, you know, customers uh, can connect their production sites, but also vessels and mines all over the world and they can be connected and they can be supported 24 7 remotely you know by the digital technology which being uh, available uh, and uh, and uh, that really helps them to adopt their business models uh, at a certain thing you know what what's what's taking place you know, uh, besides that, uh, the customer sites, I think also even uh, governments around the world are embracing, you know, the benefits of this technology. And I think it can in terms of, you know, to create both resilience and security. And we see some countries are also looking into the role that robots can play as part of national contingency plans, both in terms of production of critical goods, as well as in healthcare system. I just give you an example in in Singapore, for for instance, one of our collaborative robots are supporting uh, the the healthcare system with uh, processing fifty thousand COVID tests every day. You know, with these uh, uh, with the robotics, uh, which is mm -hmm. actually uh, ensuring consistent quality, but also freeing up medical personnel and reducing the risk of uh, uh, infection. So it's actually using the digitalization and automation, you know, to create this collaboration. And, and I think by using that, new business models can actually be created. Yes, yeah, being from this part of the world, I actually uh, did read about the story of your uh, cooperation in Singapore and also in Thailand about, uh, about uh, having robots helping, um, helping develop vaccines and all these uh, um, public health projects. And uh, Ms. Wengel, uh, I just wonder how are you thinking through a business model transformation at Johnson & Johnson? Because I think our future and also all the talking points you just mentioned requires more dynamic changes than simply applying digital technologies. Absolutely. And I think if I bring the two streams of your question together, first around stakeholders and then business models, you know, I, I'm here in front of uh, our Johnson & Johnson credo, which I, for the last three quarters of a, a century, in fact, guides our business model. And in fact, it is about the importance of all stakeholders uh, and how you deliver on all of those fronts, whether they're highly measurable or whether they are more subjective. And the four paragraphs of our credo talk first about, uh, first and foremost, first sentence, our patients, our consumers, the surgeons, the mothers and fathers, our very first responsibility uh, to them to continue to reduce costs so more people can have access, to build a robust supplier ecosystem that uh, also can earn a fair profit. It then goes to employees, the importance of us recognizing everyone for their merit, uh, to build diverse and inclusive uh, culture that uh, drives innovation. It goes to communities and our responsibility to have a healthy planet. We've had publicly facing climate goals for, for more than three decades and how we work together in communities. Um, we recently announced our race for health equity, which is really around how to ensure equitable access to health care, uh, even in more, in more disadvantaged or communities that are more disadvantaged. How do we close those gaps? Um, and then lastly is about, uh, frankly, our stockholders uh, and financials, but it's not that they come last is that if we do all those other things wisely, if we invest wisely in how technology and science come together, that, that everyone will earn a fair profit and that we'll, we will be a sustainable company making a sustainable impact. So that really is our business model. And over 135 years, you know, what, what and how that business model works with uh, healthcare systems around the world certainly has evolved. Um, I think one area for us, uh, you know, our, our goal building the digital thread for healthcare 
is around, uh, we talk internet of things, let's talk about the hospital of things and how do we help uh, hospitals no matter where in the world use from the simplest technology to the most advanced robotics, uh, you know, use digital to really drive down the cost of care, enable more access, and most importantly, enable healthcare workers to be more effective, to spend more of their time on delivering care than of managing, you know, where inventory is in the hospital, of figuring out which patient needs Needs which size knee that's going into surgery tomorrow. Let's let digital drive all of that. So those are some of the areas that we're uh, we're working on. And that sounds very promising. Uh, in fact, how far do you think we are uh, from getting there? Because um, I think it's I think it's something we want to achieve, but it's very different from what we're seeing in the news every day. <laughs> Well, I think it, you know, there's like anything where there's a very wide variation, right? You have some of the most advanced government run, you know, health systems. If you take the UK and the amount of data, for example, they've built around the virus and the pandemic in a very methodical way, very quickly and how that data is being used to guide what they do. And then you go to other advanced economies that don't have an, you harness digital as much or to hospital systems that have been able to manage these surges versus others that just at a fundamental level, you know, don't have the, the resources or the support to do that. So, you know, our, our goal is to make sure you bring the right tool and the right solution for the right problem. Uh, you know, a, a phrase that uh, I remember from some decades ago, uh, working in some different countries was around, don't bring me an airplane if I need a bicycle. Uh, so how do you help make sure that everyone, you know, can, can improve and move there in the beauty of digital and all things digital and on the foyer our technologies that as the costs go down, sometimes it's the simplest solution that just makes mm -hmm. a huge difference. Well, I mean, there are so many questions that I want to ask on that front, but due to the time limit, I have two uh, more questions that I'd like to touch up on before we uh, dive into the group dialogue. So one is on trade. So unfortunately we don't have a representative from mainland China in our panel today. Um, I learned that among the 54 companies in the, in the Global Lighthouse Network, uh, 16 of them are Chinese companies. And I'm sure all of your companies either deal with or compete with or both uh, with Chinese companies. So one thing uh, we can't deny is that many manufacturers, they are caught up in the tussle between uh, trade tensions, protectionist, uh, national security interests, and also free markets. And where should we draw the line? And do you think an inclusive future can really exist in today's uh, tech and trade competition. Anyone wants to answer that question? Uh, look, I'll, I'll start, uh, you know, as a global company, you know, we are, are not only very proud of, but very committed to our global footprint. Uh, and uh, no matter what country we're in, the importance of healthcare is very clear. Uh, if we speak specifically to China, we're very proud to have been the first joint venture pharmaceutical company uh, in China more than four decades ago. And in fact, I'm very proud one of our lighthouse factories is in fact our, our medical device plant in Suzhou, China. China. So I think we, we all have to realize the world is interconnected. It is global. We all rely on each other and we need to ensure, right, that we can maximize the value for patients uh, around the world by having access to the best, the best technologies and the best uh, solutions. Yeah. Yes, but indeed uh, we are. Uh, please. Sure. No, please come on. So I, I, I heard someone talking, but then I'll continue. Um, so let's talk, about, uh, talk more about uh, workforce because uh, the pandemic is widening gaps in many different ways. And there will likely be a growing mismatch between the current workforce's skills and employer needs as the FYR transforms industries, uh, we guess, a lot faster than workers can adapt. And how, uh, well, as we roll out more automation, how do we, support the workforce and make sure that they do not fall behind. I can maybe Anyone? start there. Uh, I think this is, of course, a very important question. It's, it's been on the agenda for quite some time as, uh, uh, you know, technology involves like it does. I think it, it all boils down to education. You know, we need to reskill the workforce, you know, to ensure that we bring them up and get them with us in, in this uh, technological uh, 
uh, transformation is taking place. So very much is focused on uh, reskilling the, uh, the the workforce. Yeah, maybe Lee, I can I can build on that. Um, first of all, I'd like to come back on on your your trade question, right? I mean, uh, we're also a global company acting in all all, all countries, and and we clearly want to say that. Um, the global trade and the, the open trade economy we had really added to the growth and the, the, the prosperity of the world. The issue is that the division of that prosperity and welfare was not nicely distributed. There were people left behind. And I think that also has been the, the, the theme of the World Economic Forum last time when we were in Davos. And I think that's a clear statement. So let's not debate that global free trade is bad for the world. It's good for the world, but it's what we do with it. And needs, that, that growth needs to be more inclusive. And, and that's what we stand for. And therefore, we need to rearrange a few of these growth figures that we include other people. That, that, that to close that first question. And the second question on the workforce. Um, I am worried. Uh, but I'm worried building up on, on the other remark of Bjorn saying, obviously, it's education. Absolutely. It is digital working. Absolutely. Where I'm afraid of is that if we go more into digital working, more into the digital way, as, as we have experienced the whole globe over the last year, that I miss the soul of the company you're working for, the soul of the, 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 the business you're working for, or your governmental party, because all these digital is nice, but the emotion, the smell of the place, the heart and soul of why you work for a certain company. And I do work 30 years for DSM, and DSM is my, my heart. But it's very difficult to, to raise new leaders in your company who feels the same way if you only go digital. And, and, and therefore, my biggest concern is how do we get the soul into, into the company, into the people, in a more digital way of working? Because that we cannot deny. Nevertheless, we're all human beings. We, not, we like the face-to-face -face contact. And it doesn't need to be all effective and productive. There's also more to it. And I don't have a solution, but it's a concern which is on top of mine. Yeah, and Dimitri, I, I, let me just add on to that because I agree with you 100% that it is a challenge, especially when you are a big company and global and in, in different parts. And uh, me as new also in the company, you can imagine how difficult it is you know, to interact in all different kinds. But I think you have to find a combination of that. I, I still think it's important. You need to sniff the, the culture of the company and you need to uh, meet people, especially also customers, to understand stand really to build up relation. But I think using the technology that is be being available, of course, you, we can be much more efficient than we have been before. And we have done a lot of things which has been maybe not necessary before. I think we've been traveling too much and so on, where we can actually limit that thing, which will actually be good not only for the society, but as, uh, also for, for, for the company and the efficiency to drive progress. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I guess we both, we need technology and all these new business uh, in terms of achieving this more sustainable future uh, for the manufacturing sector. So thank you.